Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstores virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator. And Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years of business. We credit the continued support of readers and writers and translators for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. I'm very thrilled today to be collaborating once again with our friends at New York Review Books to welcome translator Damien Searles for the release of Felix Salton's novel Bambi, which is out now from NYRB Classics. He's joined in conversation by Paul Reiter, who wrote the afterword for this edition, and Fatima Nakfi. But first is some housekeeping. Uh, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click on the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also on the bottom of your screen. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's a chat box, which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So if there's any technical issues that might arise, please bear with us and we will resolve them as quickly as we can. Uh, fall is always an exciting time for books and bookstore events. And we have a really stellar lineup of in-person and virtual ones for you. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I wanna point out in particular is on Friday, September 30th. We're very thrilled to welcome Olga Robin to celebrate her National Book Award long-listed novel, The Employees. We hope you'll come and raise a glass with us if you're here in Brooklyn. And we'll also be at the Brooklyn Book Festival on Sunday, October 2nd, so come see us there. Now a little about tonight's guests and we will get started. Damien Searles is a translator from German, French, Norwegian, and Dutch and a writer in English. He's also a former Brooklynite and community bookstore regular. Uh, he was long listed for the 2020 International Bookstore, uh, sorry, International Booker Prize with uh, Jan Fossett uh, for the other name, Septology Volumes 1 and 2, and shortlisted in 2022 for the last book in that series. He's currently on the long list twice for the National Book Award in translation, so big congratulations are in order. His own books include What We Were Doing and Where We Were Going, the Ink Blots, which is a history of the Rorschach test and biography of its creator, Herman Rorschach, and the philosophy of translation, which is forthcoming. Paul Ryder teaches in the German department at The Ohio State University. He is the co-editor, along with Chad Wellman, of Anti-Education on the Future of Our Educational Institutions by Friedrich Nietzsche, which was published by NYRB Classics in 2015. And Fatima Nakfi is Elias V. Leavenworth Professor of Germanic Languages and Literatures and of Film and Media Studies at Yale University. She's written books on victimhood in European culture after 1968, the films of Michael Haneke, the degrade degradation of the landscape and the interrelationship between space and Bildung in Thomas Bernhard. She's currently working on the hospital experience in Fin de Siècle Vienna. So without any further ado, please welcome to the screen, Damien Searles, Paul Ryder, and Fatima Nakbi. Thank you all for joining us. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Noah, for that lovely introduction. I wish I were in Brooklyn with you, um, but I'm very pleased to be here virtually with everyone to talk about this beautiful, this truly extraordinary translation of Bambi uh, in Damien Searle's um, translation and with Paul Reiser's fascinating afterward. Felix Seiten is not a household name, which is a little bit surprising considering the popularity of the 1942 Disney film with which I think it's fair to say generations of, of us have grown up. And considering also the incredible output and productivity of this fantasy expert writer who knew everybody and anybody, not only in Vienna, but in Europe in general, in the period pretty much from 1890 to 1930. Uh, all roads seem to lead to Felix Seiten when one looks at the bylines for uh, screenplays of the time, certain feuilletons. He was an important journalist and a feuilleton editor in Fantasy Acre Vienna. And, uh, and also in lots and lots of the novels, novellas, and short stories that he published. And so it's a little bit of a surprise, perhaps. Uh, and I'll ask Paul to say a little bit more about that, why Felix Seiten is so little known today and, and whether this book uh, or this new translation, which brings out so many fascinating facets of this text, which none of us knew really properly, uh, and all of us should reread if we've read it before. Um, if it if this translation also aims to bring this forgotten important figure to our to our purview, Paul. 
Well, uh, thank you, <laughs> Fatima, for um, your kind words about the afterword. And that was definitely one of my goals in starting when I started to write about Zalton about 10 years ago. I found him to be a very interesting figure for the reasons that you named. Um, he was a little bit like Max Brod of turn of the century Vienna. He was, as you say, incredibly well connected and uh, had this prolific corpus of, of works and was known principally, however, for knowing other people. Um, and so I thought that I would try to find a way to bring attention to him. At the time, I have to admit, I wasn't really so into Bambi. I, my views on the book have changed over the years and I have come to esteem it more than I did initially when I started to write about Zalton. And I was also a bit surprised by how few people knew anything about the connection between the film and the novel. Well, people didn't know about the novel at all. Um, they just thought that somehow Disney created the story. And that's, of course, due in part to Disney's uh, canny and aggressive marketing strategies. He really took it over and referred to Bambi as Walt Disney's Bambi. So I suppose, why would you think that there was a, an Austrian novel from the 1920s behind it? Um, and so I, I asked a friend of mine who uh, was and is the editor of the Jewish Review of Books if he'd be interested in a, a piece about this. Um, in uh, my thinking there was also had to do with the, the fact that I uh, wanted to address what I perceived as the Zionist echoes in the book. That's not like an original theory, but I felt that I had something to add to that discussion. And so um, he, uh, he agreed uh, to, to read an essay or run an essay. This is Abe Socher I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and so I produced this piece on Zalton and Bambi and the Zionist echoes in Bambi. And it seemed to resonate quite a bit, um, which itself was interesting for me. And I, uh, I have continued to think about Zalton and the book. And uh, I, was, I was grateful then to have the opportunity to write a bit more about it more or less 10 years later for this New York Review of Books mm -hmm. edition. I mean, he is that uh, Zionist angle that you address. Maybe you can say a little bit more. I mean, he was born as a Sigmund Salzmann in Budapest before his family moved to Vienna, actually, when he was very young. And he grew up in rather poor, uh, poor environment uh, and didn't have very regular schooling and was a little bit of a self-taught man. And politically, he was interesting because on the one hand, he had these monarchical leanings with lots of friends in the aristocracy. But on the other hand, uh, he was uh, at times a an advocate of the social democratic experiment that was Vienna in the 1920s. And then also, as you mentioned, the Zionist, um, the interest in Zionism and his, his book about Zionism. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, of course. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to be mindful of the, the time um, because I, I, I know that Damien has uh, things to say about what he finds interesting in the book and he's gonna read a little bit from the book. So I, I don't want there to be too much uh, prefatory material here, um, but uh, you'll just signal to me, I suppose, if I'm <laughs> getting into a bit too much detail with the, uh, the, the Zionist background. So um, Zalton, uh, yes, he had aristocratic friends and he also was close with some of the central figures in the uh, Young Vienna literary movement whose background tended to be a bit different from his. He, he was uh, as you pointed out, from somewhat humble circumstances, had to drop out of high school in order to help his parents support the family. He had a number of siblings. His father was actually an engineer, but not a very successful one and had quite a few kids. So Zalton dropped out of high school, started working as an insurance agent, began writing essays and poetry on the side, theater reviews, and pretty quickly was able to uh, place his, his uh, reviews in some of the better newspapers of the day, and so quit um, uh, his job as an insurance agent and started freelancing full-time. But he, because he didn't have a high school degree, 
um, was, I think, looked at a little bit askance by his better educated literary peers and was never really accepted as an equal by, um, by that group. Um, and so uh, in this way, among others, had a curious sort of insider outsider status, um, certainly among his aristocratic friends as well. Um, Zionism, uh, Zalton was also uh, unusual in this young Vienna group um, consisting mostly of assimilated Jewish authors and he certainly counted as that. He was born Zieg, uh, Zygmunt Zaltzmann, changed his name uh, to sound less Jewish. Uh, and, and yet he, uh, he did identify with the Zionist cause. He was friends with Theodor Herzl, the founder of political Zionism and wrote for Herzl's newspaper, Die Welt, The World. Um, Zalten, uh, more than Schnitzler, Stefan Zweig, I think Karl Kraus as, as well, who was kind of a rival from early on, uh, felt that anti-Semitism was a real physical danger to Jews living in Vienna. You read uh, uh, accounts of this um, from Jewish writers at the time, you get differing impressions. Some people saying that, well, you know, the anti-Semites are loud and uh, uh, they lack good taste, but we don't feel that insecure. Zalton uh, perceived anti-Semitism to be a real threat to his security. And that was one of the reasons why he was drawn to, to Zionism, which presented this as one of the reasons uh, why the Zionist movement was necessary. But ultimately, I think his real contribution to turn of the century Zionism or early 20th century Zionism lay more in the realm of cultural Zionism, um, which concerned itself with the issue of spiritual regeneration, the idea being that assimilation and discrimination had cost Jews something, um, that they lacked a strong sense of self. And as a result of that, the kind of creativity that might help Jews to develop a strong sense of self. And that the answer then was um, for Jews to bring forth great works of art in German um, or other languages, but particularly German. And this is the, uh, uh, the, the Zionism that I see being played out at times in, in Bambi more than the political Zionism, the need for security, although I think that plays a role there as mm -hmm. well. Um, so, and Paul, can I, yes, please can I jump in and, and use that as a cue, actually, so that that outstanding work of art, Damien, was that what attracted you to to retranslating this classic? I mean, it's 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 deceptively easy on the surface, I think, right, when one first reads it. And then, you know, we can talk a little bit about the problems or the difficulties of translating this particular text. But I want to know what what attracted you to to doing Saiten. Um, well, Paul really made this particular project happen. Different projects come my way in different ways. Sometimes I champion them, sometimes publishers approach me. And in this case, um, Paul and I uh, and Chad Wellman had worked together before um, the Nietzsche book that Noah mentioned. I actually translated it um, and Paul and Chad had edited it. and. You know, Paul, as a decades long Bambi fan, was trying to get NYRB to, to do it and um, wanted me to be the, the translator for it. Um, there were some complications in terms of when the book became public domain, which meant when new publishers and new translators were allowed to do it. I think uh, Paul knows more about this than I do, but um, Disney sort of finagled with the rights of Bambi, perhaps so that they wouldn't have to pay the author. So in fact, legally, because it wasn't registered for copyright with all the I's dotted and T's crossed in America, the English edition was considered the original. And so, Disney having bought those rights meant they didn't have to pay the author and also meant that it didn't go into public domain as early as it otherwise would have. Um, 
uh, the Wikipedia page is very complicated. The text, the case went up to the Supreme Court with, um, you know, people fighting against Disney, but Disney won as Disney tends to do. So the book just came into public domain this year. And uh, a few years ago, uh, when Paul again prodded um, Edwin Frank, that uh, great editor of New York Review Books Classics, uh, Edwin came to me and said, oh, Paul wants to do Bambi. He's, he's asking me about Bambi again. And the way I remember it is that Edwin said, oh, yeah, I read Bambi as a kid and, you know, it made a big impression on me. Uh, I don't really remember it now, just, and then he quoted two pages from memory. And then he said, yeah, we're going to do it. So it ended up being the um, artistic and not necessarily commercial decision on that front too. Um, so I had no connection to Bambi other than, you know, vague memories of the movie when I started the project, um, other than having heard about it through these two people I trusted. And so I was discovering it as well in the course of translating it. I mean, I think on rereading it now for me, there are these real moments of surprise, right? Uh, where these leaves are talking to one another in the midst of winter or so, uh, where this there's this beautiful perspective outside of any kind of figure within the text. I mean, all those things that, make for such an enjoyable reading experience. Uh, but some of it, I imagine, was quite hard to translate. Damien, would you like to give us maybe a little sample, a reading from? Sure. Um, I was thinking about reading from near the beginning, where they discover the you know meadow for the first time. But um, that would require me to humiliate myself in public by tearing up from Bambi. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking I'll choose another passage instead. Uh, and this one also has some more characters, which I think is one of the interesting aspects of the translation and also of the book. It's not an entire book of, you know, innocent little Bambi and his mother. It is the life of the forest, which is what the original subtitle was. Um, so this is, uh, this is about a quarter of the way into the book, like maybe a third. Bambi stepped out from under the large oak tree into the meadow. It sparkled with dew, smelled of grass and flowers and wet earth, and whispered with thousandfold life. Friend Hare was there, looking like he was pondering something very important. A proud pheasant slowly strolled by, nipping at the meadow grass and peering cautiously around in all directions. The dark blue jewelry of his throat flashed in the sun. But right in front of Bambi, very close by, stood one of the princes, who are the larger male deers. Um, Bambi had never seen him before, had in fact never seen any of the fathers from so close up. He stood before him right by the hazelnut bush, still partly concealed by the branches. Bambi didn't move. He hoped the prince would come all the way out and wondered whether he'd have the courage to speak to him. He turned around to ask his mother, but she had already moved away. She was standing far off by Aunt Aina, where Gobo and Felina were just coming out of the thicket into the meadow. Bambi stayed still thinking, now if he wanted to get to his mother and the others, you'd have to go right past the prince. That seemed wrong. Oh, well, he didn't need to ask his mother first anyway. I'll speak to this prince. I'll try. I hope the others over there see me talking to him. I'll say, good morning, prince. He can't get mad about that, can he? If he does, I'll run away. Bambi kept changing his mind, wrestling with his decision. Then the prince stepped forth from the hazel bush into the meadow. Now, Bambi thought. Then a thunderclap boomed. Bambi flinched. He didn't know what had happened. He saw the prince in front of him jump, taking a huge leap and race right past him into the forest. Bambi looked stiffly around, the thunderbolts still reverberating inside him. He saw his mother, Aunt Aina, Gobo, and Felina fleeing into the forest over on the other side of the meadow. He saw friend Hare shoot off, bewildered, saw the pheasant running with neck outstretched, 
realized that the whole forest had suddenly fallen silent. He pulled himself together and darted back into the thicket. He had taken only a few leaps and there lay the prince on the ground in front of him, not moving. Horrified, Bambi stopped, not understanding what could have happened. The prince lay bleeding, his shoulder torn open. He was dead. Don't stop, came an urgent cry from right next to him. It was his mother racing past in full gallop. Run, she cried, run as fast as you can. She didn't stop for a second and her command tore Bambi from the spot and pulled him after her. He ran with all his might. Who is that mother? He asked, who was that mother? Panting, his mother answered, that was him. Bambi shuddered and they ran. Finally, breathless, they stopped. What do you think of that? My goodness, what do you think of that? cried a diminutive voice over their heads. Bambi looked up and the squirrel came bursting through the branches. I ran the whole way here with you, she cried. It's terrible, terrible. Were you there when it happened? Bambi's mother asked. But of course I was there, the squirrel said. I'm still shaking all over. She sat up straight, leaned on her wonderful tail, showed her narrow white breast and pressed both her front paws to her body in a gesture of assurance. I am all a quiver. I feel exhausted from the shock too, Bambi's mother said. It's unbelievable. None of us saw anything. Really? The squirrel got excited, but you're wrong there. I'd been watching him for a while. Me too, cried another voice. It was the magpie. She came flying over and landed on a branch. Me too, came a shrill jeer from even higher. There on an ash tree sat the jay. And from the tops of the trees, a couple of crows grumpily interrupted with their squawks. We saw him too. They all sat there talking self-importantly. They were much more agitated than usual. And it seemed full of anger and trepidation. Who, thought Bambi, who had they seen? I tried my hardest, the squirrel said, holding both front paws to her heart in affirmation. I tried as hard as I could to make the poor prince notice. And me, the jay blared. I shouted so many times, but he didn't hear me. He didn't hear me either, the magpie cackled. Ten times I called out. I was right about to fly over to him. I thought if he doesn't hear me this time, I'll fly over to the hazel bush he's standing next to. Then he'll have to hear me, but that's just when it happened. My voice is louder than yours. I warned him as best I could, the crow said bitterly. But the lords pay too little attention to people like us. It's true, much too little, the squirrel agreed. We do what we can, the magpie said. It's certainly not our fault when disaster strikes. Such a handsome prince, the squirrel lamented, and in the prime of his life, too. Crawr, the jay squawked. If only he hadn't been so proud and had paid attention to us. He certainly wasn't proud, the squirrel argued back. The magpie added, no prouder than the other princes of his kind. In other words, dumb, laughed the jay. You're the dumb one, cried the crow from above. Don't tell me about being dumb. The whole forest knows how dumb you are. Me, replied the jay, rigid with surprise. No one can say I'm dumb. A little forgetful, maybe. Definitely not dumb. Whatever you say, the crow said seriously, forget it. But the fact is, the prince didn't die because he was proud or dumb. It was because it's impossible to escape him. Crawr, squawked the jay. I don't like conversations like this. He flew away. The crow kept talking. In fact, he has even outsmarted many of my kind. He kills whoever he wants. Nothing can help us. I'll stop there. Thank you, Damien. Uh, it's such a lovely passage, and I can't believe how many different verbs you found for all the verbs that uh, he, that Saiten himself used in the German. I mean, I was as I was reading it, the Viennese in me thought I didn't, I didn't know some of these words for specific birds. Um, can you talk a little bit about the use of pronouns in this text and the way in which you translated them to keep that sense of like mystery? Because the novel does a beautiful job of making us feel 
this violence that comes so suddenly upon them from people, but without making it specific and with that sense of amazement and wonder at this violence, which is greater than anything that the animals perpetrate on one another. Right. Um, although there is some bad animal on animal violence too. I mean- There like, is too, yeah, no doubt. Um, but um, yeah, you know, a lot of the translation issues with this particular book um, are, are, I think, a little more invisible to the English reader than maybe in other projects, because it has to do with um, with things that the German language does that English can't do, and you have to figure out whether you're going to let it go or or try and make it work. So the issue of the names and the pronouns. Um, in German, like uh, other languages you may be familiar with, the nouns all have genders. So there's different forms of like the, depending on whether it's a masculine, feminine, or neuter noun. And, you know, objects have gender, so they're not literal genders. But similarly, different species of animals have masculine, feminine, or neuter nouns. And so when you refer to those animals, you use that gender, irrespective of whether it's a male or female animal. So for example, squirrel is a neuter noun. So the squirrel in the original German is always it. Um, but you have to decide whether to call it, it, he, or she. In the squirrel's case, the problem is solved because in a later chapter, another squirrel remembers his grandmother who used to know Bambi as a kid. So this squirrel is she. But for the other cases, even like the magpies, it turns into, um, you know, kind of a complicated question. It's probably not a coincidence that magpie is a feminine noun and magpies are considered to be like naggy and annoying creatures who are just meddling and gossiping all the time. So if I call her she, am I just sort of succumbing to sexist ideology? Am I just being neutral? If I call the magpie he, then does someone who actually knows more about birds than I do going to be like, well, this magpie, you know, is clearly sitting on the branch in such a way that it's a feminine a female magpie, like what's wrong with this translator? Um, but yeah, all of the animals, uh, it, it became trickier than you think it would be to sort of decide how are you going to present them. Um, Bambi's mother is always referred to in German as the mother, which of course is nice in the German and gives it this sort of archetypal mm -hmm. sense. but you can't go around saying, you know, the mother said all the time. So you have to change it to his mother or Bambi's mother or something. You have to make some decision. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even with the species, um, one of the animals we see in the book is a, is a polecat, according to the dictionary. And I don't know what a polecat is. I imagine like some sort of dwarf tiger or some cat thing. You know, like what's a polecat? And so what it is is it looks like a sort of weaselly ferrety thing. Okay. And when I read polecat, that is not what I picture at all. Although obviously, if you know what a polecat is, you'll picture a polecat. But I wanted to change it to weasel, but then a weasel comes up later, so maybe ferret. But are there ferrets in the European forest? Like I ended up caving and calling it a polecat, but what that raises is the question of audience, you know, is, am I writing this English for like American city kids like me or like I was, or am I like trying to be faithful to the zoological knowledge that's in the book that there's quite a lot of, I mean, right. um, and I think I think that comes out in the dialogue. Like I think the squirrels sound like squirrels, and I think the jays sound like jays, and that just is, um, you know, Zalton's skill mm -hmm. as an author characterizing the different characters. But you really do get a sense that 
not everyone is just being anthropomorphized, that you're getting the kind of personality of the different animals. Right, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's also this funny shift, right, from these humorous, uh, the cacophonous uh, commentary by the birds in particular on these very serious events that transpire. So there's this nice shift going on, too, where you have to capture the humor of, of what's going on and they're kind of infighting at the same time while you're trying to show this Bambi, this little deer processing or trying to process what has just happened to one of its princes or leaders. I mean, the zoological knowledge is actually really interesting too to me because it makes these kinds of hierarchies right between the animals in the forest and then he, the man uh, above it all. But the, even there, like Bambi and the other small deer talk to the smaller animals, but they shy away from the Hirschen, so the, the stags and the, the larger species of deer that exist in Europe. And so that too, I imagine being difficult because Paul, right, these things, when you read it as a kind of allegorically, right, or politically, then you'd expect these differences to mean, right? Right, well, the sh shyness around the bigger animals, um, bigger deer especially, that, that was, I think, nicely expressed in the wonderful passage that, that Damien read. And that is an important theme in, in Bambi. Um, you could say that there is kind of a movement, almost a Freudian movement in the story from identification with the mother. That's how it begins with Bambi and the mother together, um, being Bambi being bathed by the mother in this beautiful moment of, of intimacy. And then the magpie comes and starts peppering the mother with questions and it's kind of funny. Um, and you get it. Uh, you 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 have some of that annoyingness for what for the uh, for which the magpie is, is is known. But then Bambi um, is shy around uh, his his the deer who turns out to be his father, um, referred to as the old stag, um, also. And then particularly around the the elk, um, who are you know these massive um, relatives of the deer, and. It's there, it's in the scene where Bambi is listening to the mating song of the elk, uh, that the terminology that Zalton uses in his cultural Zionist writing really shows up in Bambi, that vocabulary is, is, is there, where, where Bambi hears this song. And it's, it's described as exactly the kind of poetry written by Jews that Zalton wants to see, something primordial that really gets the blood stirring. And that's what, what happens to Bambi there. And he's drawn to it and intimidated at the same time and feels proud, but small. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I think, a very interesting moment in the, in the, in the story. Paul, I, I wonder what you would, um, what you would say about, in a way, how obvious or subtle that reading is. Um, I, I mean, like, I, for example, don't really pick up on very much of the political Zionist stuff at all when I read it. Um, and that doesn't mean I think that reading is wrong. It means that from my perspective, that reading is quite subtle um, as, as opposed to being a kind of one of your more blatant allegories of Jewish life in Europe or whatever. So. Um, you know, I like uh, the scene where Bambi first meets, I think it's a, a rabbit, and he sort of realizes that the rabbit is kind of small, and he feels a little contemptuous. Uh, and it, it's described, I don't remember what page it is, but it's described very interestingly, where it's just this sort of law of nature thing that Bambi feels that this creature is kind of beneath him. And he doesn't mean anything bad by it. It's nothing personal, but he just sort of naturally experiences that. And I thought that was an interesting moment of having Bambi, even like young baby Bambi, not big stag, end of the book Bambi. Like, um, you know, he's not the bottom rung of the ladder and that there's this real ladder there that has nothing to do with his personal feelings or something. So I don't know, I thought, I don't know the connection between that and the Zionism question, I guess. But um, in a way, that's the context I read the book in, like more of this sort of Hermann Hesse, German nature mysticism, like 
beautiful rhythms of the forest thing. Yeah. Well, it's certainly worth pointing out, I think, that, that Zalton had an intention for the work um, beyond you know, wanting to sell units because Zalton was always uh, short of money, he liked to live beyond his means. Um, he, uh, he was a devoted hunter and a, a, a nature enthusiast. And you see, we've talked about how he, uh, he, he displays pretty self-consciously and extensively his knowledge of, of, of nature, of terms that don't come up very often. You have to look up a lot of words to, in, in reading this book and in, in the original if you don't have some kind of extensive forest vocabulary. Um, and he was a little bit contemptuous of people he regarded as kind of half-assed nature enthusiasts, people who like to go out into the park and look at the trees. And for them, nature was nature on a nice Sunday, not far from the city, when in fact, nature was much more complicated and had its natural brutality. And that's what he wanted to, um, to represent, to present really um, in a, a forceful, engrossing way. And I think he succeeded there. The Zionist allegory, I'm not suggesting that that's something that Zalton consciously set out to do. And I certainly uh, don't expect most readers to, uh, to, to come to it without uh, a little bit of prompting from the afterward, perhaps. <laughs> um, but if you come to Zalton or to this to this book as 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 I did from having read uh, Zalton's cultural and political Zionist writings and and um, having focused on that aspect of turn of the century and early twentieth century Viennese culture, then it is it is there. Um, and in fact, people picked up on it at the time. Contemporary contemporary readers did um, in uh, an early review of the uh, Whitaker Chambers 1928 English translation, a critic uh, said about the fox that he appears to be the Goebbels of the forest. Um, or no, that must have been too early. That wouldn't have been uh, uh, maybe in the early 30s, this connection was, was, was made. Um, and uh, there were political readings of the film, by the way, as, as, as well, this theme of violence and persecution. I mean, it stuck with, with people. An early reviewer of the film, which came out in 1942, suggested that it registered America's trauma over Pearl Harbor and, and loss of influence, this intrusion of violence into a scene that seems so, so hal halcyon. Um, what people have mostly emphasized um, in talking about the Zionist connection is simply the theme of persecution, which is prominent in the book. And um, the animals talk quite a bit about safety and whether they'll ever be able to be safe. And then of course, there's the figure of Gobo, Bambi's cousin who trusts him and uh, is, uh, is, his trust is proved to be uh, badly misplaced because he, in fact, is is killed by. Spoilers, by man! Spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I did want to mention Gobo, who's an interesting character that's not in the movie. So there, um, the movie, as you might expect, changes things. There's no thumper in the book, although there is friend hair. Um, but Gobo uh, is. Unfortunately, his fate already given away by Paul just now is um, uh, is shot and seemingly killed by the hunters, but it turns out is captured. And then at some later point, he reappears and is a real apologist for the humans about you know how warm it is in the house and when it's snowing and raining outside, it's lovely in there and there's like good food all winter that you don't have to look for and like humans are great. Um, so um, a, a lot in the second half of the book of the kind of navigation of the relationship between human and animal is through this character Gobo. And when Gobo expresses these attitudes, Bambi's father, the old stag, who some have suggested is a kind of Herzl figure, seems to have some similarities with, with Herzl, shakes his head and says about Gobo, oh, 
this poor um, child, you know, so wrongheaded. Um, and so, uh, you know, there the allegory seems to be kind of, kind of thick, but I'm not suggesting at all, wouldn't suggest at all that uh, if you don't pick up on this, this line of, of interpretation that you've missed the essential thing in the book, you can, have, you can have a deep reading of the book without talking about Zionism or anti-Semitism at all, in, in, in my opinion. I mean, I was struck actually reading another book of uh, Seitens, Five Minutes America, where he talks about his trip to the United States. And he has this long passage about the slaughter yards in Omaha, uh, I think it is. And there, you know, he wades through, like he goes from room to room and he sees the way animals are killed and, and gutted within the shortest period of time. And this kind of overwhelming force used against animals by human beings. And I thought that really, you know, I, I think this, this book was written a little bit later after Bambi, um, when he did this reportage and tried to save the United States from all the negative attributes given to it by the Viennese intelligentsia. But in that scene, I thought that was really like that description of those slaughter yards. That's where that, I don't even know how you say it in English that, um, that massive hunt that takes place in, in Bambi where the animals are really driven from the forest in a very- yeah, That's an amazing scene, you know. Extraordinary. I, I, I've translated like nonfiction Holocaust roundup scenes. And, but this scene was like, sets your heart pounding when suddenly it's not just him, the one person, but like all the hunters show up and they're making these loud noises to scare all the animals. and the animals are terrified and like running this way and that and no one knows what to do and like birds keep thudding from the sky and the guns keep going off and it's this incredible set piece scene that's sort of right at the end of the first half of the book um that is just you know incredible writing um it not not so easily excerptable for a reading because of the way that it builds and you know the animal that you see rushing past like turns up later and all this kind of stuff so it's not a passage i can read or something but it really is a, a incredibly powerful moment mm -hmm. in the book I have to say, though, before we go to the questions from the audience, uh, rereading the Bambi and then also rewatching Bambi <laughs> gave me a new appreciation for actually for both of them for different things. Uh, so I actually thought that that both was uh, were quite fantastic, but I thought they were both in such a way, in a way, it's such an interesting choice because, you know, to describe them as a kind of Bildungsroman, a novel of education or formation, right, from young young deer to stag at the end to, to prince or you know to old uh, king of the of the forest i mean it it seemed to me much more a kind of schooling in loneliness and in in kind of abnegation right uh that that's what what you know if you really follow the teachings that are in this in this short book that it goes more in that direction and neither very fitting for a you know, a children's film from 1942, or even, you know, for the selling of this, of these Bambi books. Uh, and I had shown this to, to Paul and Damien earlier on, that these were the way in which they were sold was actually, it seems to me, very much geared toward a young audience. So a two volume set of the two Bambi books, so Bambi and Bambi's children, um, with lots of drawings and, and designs and the whole thing. So not really geared to the adult audience that I hope this book now finds after this uh, beautiful edition came yeah, out. At the same time, you know, it, when I was reading the passage I was reading, I was thinking like, oh my God, you can totally see why Disney's into this. The squirrel being all squirrely and the jay being all jayish and the crows being all crowy, like, you know, that totally That's felt l like, you know, a Disney moment, not in the dismissive sense. Um, this one, but, this one also had a, uh, I guess, a political affinity with it as well. He thought of it as an anti-hunting film and was a, a pretty um, active anti-hunting person. And um, Zalton was a hunter, but he was very critical of 
the kind of hunting that we see in the film, this, this mass hunting for him, hunting should have been a more meditative activity where you're just lying, observing quietly um, until you have moments, you know, to, to shoot. But in any case, um, uh, I mean, I don't think that it, I, it, 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 when it, when it came out in the Neue Freie Presse, which was basically the New York Times of turn of the century Vienna, it wasn't presented as a, as a children's story. Um, and then over, over time, it, you know, it has become that. You know, that's always so interesting. Like, what actually does make something a children's book? Like, is Tom Sawyer originally a children's book? What about Huckleberry Finn? Lord of the Rings? You know, Dracula? Um, the things that get called, you know, Jane Eyre? Like, I don't know, the things that get classified as children's books, I think is a, a really interesting, you know, historical topic. And, um, you, you know, that's one of the things that people ask me when they've heard that I, I was doing or have done Bambi. First thing they said is, what do you mean? I thought that was just a movie. I didn't know that was a novel. Like no one I have spoken to knew it was a book. Um, but then also, you know, is it a kid's book? both questions of like, can my kid read it or is it too sad? And then the question of like, should I, the grown up, read it or is it just a kid's book? Um, and yeah, those are those are interesting. You have to say it's a German's kid book, like, the, you know. <laughs> Brothers <laughs> Grimm fairy tales, not like <laughs> Disney Snow White or whatever, yeah. So, Noah, do we want to go to questions? Yeah, just to the... I think that's a great idea. We have a good number of questions in the in the uh, Q and A right now. Those of you at home, uh, please keep submitting your questions. We'll help try to get to as many as we can. Um, also, just thank you, the three of you, for this fascinating conversation. It's gone so many directions already that I I had not anticipated. So this has been fascinating from an audience perspective. Um, while we're talking about um, audiences and Disney, I think you've, you've all just addressed a lot of the questions that are in the Q&A to some ex, uh, extent, but Tess Lewis is asking, um, is there evidence of how Salton felt about the Disney version? We talked about how Disney saw Salton. Now we're kind of wondering how did Salton feel about Disney? Um, are there any, and are there off, any plans? But other than that. <laughs> ripped off? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. He, well, he was, he was in desperate straits when the movie appeared. His books were banned in Germany. And he had sold the rights to a different filmmaker for not very much money. And that filmmaker wanted to do Bambi as a live action film. And that proved not to be doable. And so Disney then got the rights and um, Zalton thought that Disney should have given him some money um, because of how successful the film was and how little did, uh, Disney had to pay for it. And, you know, the Hollywood studios were helping uh, German Jewish refugees in various ways at this time, but Disney didn't do anything to help Salton. Salton did claim that he appreciated the film, but that the film was always, uh, that it was Disney's Bambi, and that was not not his Bambi. Salton was you know, someone who knew quite a bit about filmmaking in the film industry, written a number of screenplays and had been involved in some film productions in, in Vienna. That was very interesting. Um, Taz's follow-up question is, are there any plans for a new translation of the sequel, Bambi's Children, Bambi's Kinder? Um, as I mentioned, I came to this project without prior knowledge of Bambi. And from everything I've heard, the sequel's not so good. So uh, there are no plans that I know of. I would love to see some other Zalton translations in the NYRB Classics series. Uh, some of his short novels, I, I, I think, are really great. Um, he had something of a, I don't know, you could say, a feminist streak and um, wrote about some novels about the mistreatment of, of young uh, women without means by older men with means in Vienna. This is an interest that he and Schnitzler shared and Schnitzler, who was a close friend of Zalton's, admired Zalton's uh, novels in this area or novellas really. Um, um, you know, uh, I, maybe it'll, it'll happen. <laughs> well, 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 we'll see. Yeah, I mean, we can all hope. Um, do we know if there's, is, has there been any other Zalton that's been translated 
in English or is it really just Bambi that's available? Oh, Bambi's Children was translated back in the day. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the old translation of that is available if you're dying of curiosity. After. A number of his animal stories have been translated and a number of them were made into uh, films and even TV series or were the, served as, the, uh, as, a, as a basis for films and TV series in the, uh, in the US. The Shaggy DA has a kind of connection to that franchise, to a Zalton figure, the, the Hound of Florence and uh, Perry the Squirrel. Um, got some, <laughs> some Perry got a film, film version. I was a, that's a Zalton creation. So fifteen, the fifteen rabbits. Uh, that that uh, novel has been translated into English. If you're interested, <laughs> <laughs> lots lots to uncover there. Um, great. So we have a question from Linda Weitz. Uh, Linda Weitz, uh, how does your translation differ from? Chambers' original 1928 translation, um, and what is your opinion of the Chambers translation? That's maybe one for all of you. Um, yeah, so uh, I tend to not sort of have the older translation of something I'm retranslating like open while I'm doing it, because it seems to um, distract and detract more than it really adds. But when it comes to moments I want to double check or or when I'm done with the book and I sort of look around to see what it's like. Um, the the Chambers translation, like, yes, it really is that Whitaker Chambers, as in Alger Hiss Whitaker Chambers, which is bizarre. But um, aside from that, um, you know, it's, it's okay, but it's old and it is, um, it's not, super careful, like it skips some sentences or paragraphs here and there. And, you know, it is partly from a earlier era's view of translation where kind of quasi academic scrupulosity is considered necessary, even in literary non academic translation, where, you know, it's just not allowed for translators to just cut stuff if they feel like it or whatever. So um, I wouldn't, you know, recommend it. I just think it's um, it was it was popular. I read somewhere it sold half a million copies before the movie came out, um, and um, it had. I mean, one reason it was popular is that it had a little one page forward by. Nobel Prize winner John Galsworthy saying Felix Alton is a poet and this book is so great. And actually the, the preface is, is extremely charming for the like one page celebrity preface genre because it describes him on a train with his family and he finishes a page and hands it to his wife and starts the next page. And when she finishes the page, she hands it to the older kid. And when the older kid finishes, hands it to, cause they all just can't wait to like see what happens. And so, you know, it was a, it was a fine translation, but there's, there's no real reason to go back to it now. And that what you were mentioning, uh, Damien was retranslated into the German advertisement for Bambi and Bambi's children. And at the end, they translated his sentence, John Gal Galsworthy sentence. I uh, I particularly recommend it to all the hunters out there. Uh -huh. yeah. Wow, um, particularly recommended it to the hunters. This is great because there's a question from Luke McNeil um, asking if the book isn't anti-hunting, like the, the Disney movie appeared to be, is Zalton's Bambi commenting more generally on human cruelty or um, something else maybe? Good question, you know, because um, there definitely is the human cruelty that's on a different level than animal on animal cruelty. And yet um, there is the polecat that kills the mouse. There is the fox that kills the pheasant, especially when winter comes. And um, there's also the the domesticated dogs are these interesting figures who are like 
on the animal side, but they've gone over to the human side and now they're the, you know, um, scabs of the animal world or however you want to put it. So um, it is, it is, you know, complicated. Um, I guess, again, my way of reading it is in this kind of exploration of the poetry and mystery of nature kind of thing. So that it's hard for me to really grasp it as not an anti-hunting book because I personally have anti-hunting preconceptions of my own, I guess. But um, I guess I would understand it as the way that like, the stereotypical Native American view of hunting, where it's about actually participating in the cycles and, um, you know, forces of nature, as opposed to just coming in with your machine gun and slaughtering everything. Um, you know, uh, when I when I think about that, uh, then I can sort of see how a hunter could have written this book. But, um, but as an everyday reader, I have to admit, like it, it reads pretty anti-hunting to me. I mean, I think we get a sense also of this kind of incredible power differential, right? And that when you, you over exploit that power differential in these kinds of mass hunts, uh, then you're, you're doing, then it's not a hunt anymore, then it's a travesty of a hunt. Uh, and it's it's not yeah it is as you know Paul said it doesn't show the kind of respect and the the kind of deep knowledge of the animals that you're l communing with while you're also hunting them right that's another incredible scene in the book where the animals are trying to figure out like mm -hmm. how come there's this loud bang and then someone on the other end of the field suddenly has his shoulder torn open like what is going on they can't figure it out they're like oh you know he has a extra third hand that he throws but it's like too fast for us to see it or can it really be a hand doesn't it have to be teeth because it like tears the body open and they're just trying to like figure it out like what is going on with this like weird metal arm that flashes and like suddenly something happens somewhere else so those scenes are very powerful because of the defamiliarization of the of the the gun or the rifle and sort of making you feel how deeply alien into the natural world it really is Paul, maybe you want to say something to Saiten's own war experience. I mean, this is four years after World War I, right? Where mechanized slaughter has a different, you know, where guns have taken on a different kind of much more frightening form, right? Right. Um, and there, uh, there, you know, is uh, also um, the change in hunting practices after the war. There's a scene in um, uh, the movie Sunshine, with the film Sunshine, the Istvan Zabo film, where uh, uh, this is a, a kind of an, an epic about Hungarian Jewish identity. And uh, there's a hunting scene that takes place right before World War I, um, which is hunting in a very genteel aristocratic manner. It's group hunting. But it's hunting with shotguns, and um, there is a lot of de decorum being maintained. And then there's a uh, a hunting scene uh, that takes place in the 20s, and it's hunting with automatic weapons, and it's just a crazy bloodbath. And to some extent, that's that that, that movement is a little portraying it that way is a little bit problematic because Franz Ferdinand was known for his incredibly brutal hunting practices. So it's not as though hunting before the, the war was uh, somehow um, necessarily or always cleaner than hunting between the wars. But there there is this increased violence in, in uh, society, Viennese society, after uh, German society uh, scores of political murders taking place. It's just a more violent climate and um, af after World War I. Um, and so 
Uh, it's not surprising, I suppose, given that, that uh, the animal story that Salton wrote right after the war would be a, uh, an animal story with a higher degree of, of carnage, with, with, with more carnage in it. Um, and I wanted to try at some point to work the turn of the, the, the between the wars context um, into this discussion. We don't have time for it, um, which, is, uh, which, is, which is too bad. Um, uh, because it's not something that I really addressed so much in the afterward, but uh, well, you know, maybe another day we'll we'll uh, we'll get to it. I did want to uh, just say one last thing, which is uh, that I really uh, think Damien was being a bit too modest in talking about his translation versus the Whitaker Chambers translation. It, there's a, there's a, a night and day difference. Um, it's a much more sensitive translation and uh, it captures the changes of register in the different, uh, the, uh, the different animal voices so, so much more effectively. Um, so uh, if you're thinking of getting you know, a copy of this, do yourself a favor and get, uh, get Damien's version. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. Um, it's a ph phenomenal translation. It's beautiful on the page and it's a beautiful book too. Um, so I'll encourage all of you at home, pick up a copy of Bambi from Community Bookstore or your local, your favorite local independent bookstore. Um, in the meantime, thank you all so much for doing this with us. Uh, Damien, Paul, Fatima, this was such a pleasure. Um, those of you at home, thank you for your very, very thoughtful questions. And we hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.